Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good. I'm doing good. I'm missing my grandkids. I'm always missing my grandkids. Uh, the good news is I will see uh, I will see one of them who I miss a real lot, who lives in Las Vegas. I will see him this week since I'm going out there for ESPN to cover that show. Out there with Pereira is now the headliner instead of McGregor because McGregor got injured. Um, so, I, you know, I got good things in front of me. And uh, I also, over the weekend, it's always good to see good people. Uh, a friend of mine who happens to be the founder and owner of Box Raw, uh, the, the sportswear company that's based out of England. Uh, he's a former fighter. His name is Ben Amana. And I, uh, he came to me some years ago to do a clothing line of, he's doing stuff with Bevo, he's doing stuff with Crawford, he's, he's doing stuff with all the, all the top guys in boxing. And a few years ago he came to me and we did a little something, a little, uh, Teddy Atlas line, but, uh, he, it was just nice to see him. He, he came in town for some business from across the pond and, um, from England, for the people that don't understand what across the pond uh, means, <laughs> and he, uh, he he spent, you know, he spent some time with me and my wife, and had dinner with us, and it was just, uh, it was great to talk to him. Great, to, like I said, I just like seeing good people. I just like to be around good people, and he's also a good person who's very incentivized, you know, very um, driven. And not only does he have the Box World Sporting Clothing Company, but now he's he's doing a lot of other things, including just made his own boxing glove. Just uh, just just finished uh, designing uh, a boxing glove that he was illustrating, showing well. He showed it to me, and I was very impressed with it. I was impressed with the design, how it locked, takes care of the thumb, it takes care of the wrist, it takes care of you know. Uh, the knuckle area, it even gives you something to, to grip down on, to, to, to pull, to pull the, uh, you know, to pull the, uh, when, when you're, when you're hitting with the, with the glove and you're hitting against the bag or sparring, whatever you're doing, uh, the force can obviously traumatize the knuckles and there's a lot of injuries. So he put a little bar in there like the old days where you grip down on it and that will absorb the impact. That will take a lot of the force away from the hand, which obviously is smart. So um it was just it was just a nice it was a nice visit and nice to see that he's got things cooking for the future. Uh and he's always moving forward. I always say, you know, I have a saying with the young people out there that if you're treading water, you're in the first phase of drowning. <laughs> you just don't know it yet. You got to be moving towards something. You got to be swimming towards something. Even if you don't know exactly what it is, move, move, move towards something. And uh, and he's always moving towards something. So anyway, I want to say that. And I want to I want to jump right into boxing. And before... We jump into the fights that have taken place over the week. There were a lot of fights, UFC um, and, and boxing, a lot of DAZN, ESPN, you know, and of course, uh, as I just said, UFC. But there's, there's a couple fights on the horizon, and I'm going to jump right into saying it. Uh, Tank Davis, Lomachenko, because I want to get to people's attention right away, right at the beginning of this show. Tank Davis was spectacular. Lomachenko, by the way, <laughs> a little earlier, what was it, two months ago, a month and a half ago, spectacular. Um, yep. Difference in age, of course. Davis, 29, Lomachenko, 36. Yeah, yeah. I wish that uh, we were talking about this four years ago, five years ago, uh, no doubt about it, and and, and w where we could have Tank at his prime, you know, he's at his prime now, so we could have prime now and then Lomachenko, the version of him five years ago, but you can't do that, you can't turn the clock back, uh, it, it hasn't been done yet, so it looks like they're heading towards that fight, and again, I, I make no, you know, 
I, I know no qualms about it. I, I don't mince my words. I, I think it's a few years too late for Lomachenko, but it's the fight that would have been on my bucket list some years ago. Would have been on my buck. And and look, I'm still going to be interested, but not quite the same, but on my bucket list because it would have been Lomachenko's style, his his ability to press you while making you miss, and and to to look to take your heart away, to look to yep. do what the kung fu guys used to do, where they go yeah into your chest and they pull your heart out while it's still beating, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know. And he there was nobody better at doing it than Lomachenko. And then Tank Davis comes along and he starts developing, and he he is superb, but he's superb with power. And but with everything else too, with the technique, with making you miss, with being able to press you, with being able to counter punch, you know, with his IQ, all the things that Lomachenko, you know, brings to the forefront, he has too. With the vision, with seeing everything, X ray vision, seeing all the openings, knowing when to throw, knowing what punch to throw. Man, man. Ah, oh, I wish the fight was for Lomachenko at least he was a little younger, but that fight's going to wind up happening because they're both with the same, you know, because, uh, I mean, they're, they're, it's just, it's a fight now that I think uh, is, they're going to try to make it. And I think it's it's probably going to wind up uh, being made. Uh, obviously, the Lomachenko has moved up a couple weight classes. Uh, this is his, this, he ain't going no higher. I mean, obviously, at this point in his career. And, and not that he could, anyway, with his skeleton. Uh, you know, this this is the max for him. And Tank Davis, you know, with the power he has, could he move up to 140? Yeah, yeah, he could. And with his, with his ability to, to box and to do all the things he does with his tremendous technique and IQ and everything else, yeah, he probably could. But this is the way to make this fight. Um this is the prime right now for them there at that weight. Uh, I, I just had to, I just had to talk about it. It's still gonna be, it's still gonna be something to, to watch it to, where people are gonna be really tuning in when that fight. I, I, I believe it will get made, but if it does get made, they'll be tuning in two southpaws uh, again, just two guys that, at the end of the day. I'm watching it to see, and and if it had been a, a Lomachenko who was 31 instead of 36, this is what, and I'd still be looking for it, but this is what I was looking to, to see. Everyone's going to say, you're looking to see their skill sets, you're looking to see you know, their hand speed, you're looking to see the body punching they both do tremendously, you're looking to see the ability to make a guy miss, the ability to counter, you're looking to see all of that. I'm looking to see who breaks whose will. Yeah, yeah, I said it. I said it. That That's what it, for me, that's what that fight, and, and most top fights come down to that. But that's what this fight specifically with their skill sets, their styles, their mentalities, whose will can be broken? If anyone's yep. can be broken, whose will can be stolen, taken from them? So anyway, I wanted to mention that. I think that would uh, be a good one for, for Rob to, to both clip at some point, but also to, to start the show with. To get people's attention. The other one I want to go with real quick, Ken, in a way, Espinosa. We're going to talk about Espinosa. Espinosa is the new star. He's the new star in the block. He's the new star. He's 24 years old. What is he? 23 and 0 now. He just scored a knockout. Devastating. Unbelievable. We're going to break the fight down. But he he just scored a knockout Saturday. He he won the title against a really, really, and Ramirez, a really good fighter. He got dropped early. He came off the floor and almost knocked out the champion, who was a two-time gold medalist uh, from Cuba. He almost knocked him out in the 12th round. So this is a guy that didn't get a freebie when he won the title. He had a tough fight, though. He was the big underdog. He wins the title in, in Rocky S fashion uh and now when i saw him perform the way he did say he he he's there, there's a star born 
There's a star part. And I know already, because in a way, the great in a way, the great, great, great in a way, uh, he's, they're already talking about him moving up. You know, he's already moved up. How many clients? I don't know, three, four. They're already talking about him now moving up from, from junior featherweight to featherweight. And, and, and there's got to be a little concern. How many classes can you move up? As great as Inoue is, how many can you move up? I know they're going to try to make this fight. I hope they don't make it too soon because I think Espinosa needs a little more time, really. Uh, but how about I give you a little peek into my, my own crystal ball, for what it's worth, of what happens if they make it. Well, maybe if they make it any time, but... Obviously, if they make it sooner than later, it is a fight that will get the fight fans' attention. It's a fight that, in a way, will obviously have to be on his P's and Q's, the way Espinosa, he, first of all, he's the tallest featherweight in the history of featherweights. He's six foot one, okay? In the history of boxing. So, and he can punch. And he's getting better. He's getting better and better. And he, in a way, as great as he is, he would have to be crossing his T's, dotting his I's for this fight. Having said all that, I think that when the fight gets made, in a way, will show why he's so great. And I love Espinosa. Right now, he's one of my favorite fighters. I love him. But he will show why he's so great, Ken. He will do, I think, and I want to be the first to say this because I know other people are probably going to start grabbing it and say it later. It's just the way it works sometimes. But he will look to do, I think, what Mayweather, the great Floyd Mayweather, did to Diego Corrales years ago when everyone thought that was going to be a very competitive fight, very similar to Espinosa Corrales, tall, wiry, really good puncher, accurate puncher, and Mayweather just took him apart. Just took him apart. I think there's a chance in a way does that. Takes him apart. Yeah, he's a tall guy who can punch, but there's a lot of body there. In a way, he's a great body puncher. He goes to the body. And Espinosa, he doesn't really use his height. He he fights you. That's one of the things that, that makes you love him. He just goes and fights you. And when you fight a guy and you stand tall, sometimes you can be, obviously, you can be a target. And I think that in a way would zoom in on that target to the body and then eventually to the head and maybe do maybe do what Mayweather did to the great Diego Corrales, who God bless him, he's up in heaven, he's not with us anymore. But I I just wanted to put that out there. I want to put that out there as a as a little bone, a little teaser uh, for the for the fans to get started with this show. And now let's go to the fights that took place Saturday. How, how, what do you think, Ken? What do you think? I love it. Before we do, though, let me give a quick shout out to our number one sponsor, Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Atlas to take advantage of this incredible offer that I'm going to tell you about. Ten free travel packs with your first purchase. Teddy, all of us are born with one responsibility. It's ours from the cradle to the grave, and that's the responsibility to take care of yourself. No one's going to come in and tell you what to eat, when to work out, and everything that goes with it. But with Athletic Greens, I consider it an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity. No matter what your diet looks like, Athletic Greens is going to make sure you get the essential vitamins, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics, and everything in between. Athletic Greens is the all-in-one green drink that's made from 75 whole food source ingredients. They developed this with the input of tons of different doctors and physicians, nutritionists. They're really best in class. So if you're only taking one supplement, please make it Athletic Greens. I've been taking it for several years, especially when I travel, which is why I love these free travel packs that come with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Atlas to take advantage of the offer and get your health dialed in and handle your number one responsibility. Uh, and if you've noticed, if you've noticed over the years since Ken met me and since he started doing this show with me, his life has changed. But if you notice, yep. he's gotten younger. He's gotten younger. <laughs> now, now I don't know if I, I never knew I had those qualities. I never knew that I had those abilities. I, I don't know. I don't, but I don't know if it was me or Athletic Greens. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna tilt towards me. But Athletic Greens definitely, definitely 
had something to do with it. Okay. It's, you, it's what either you, that or the 4,000 miles a year I've run for the last five years. But the combination of taking care of all the little things is what contributes to the overall system. Yeah, but you, couldn't run, you couldn't run those 4,000 miles if there was a magic happening in the last five years of your life uh, with this show. Uh, where you can yeah. see it. Look at your <laughs> hair. Look at your skin. Look, everything, yeah. everything, everything. What so subscribe to the show so you can get on the health kick with yes, us. Yes, sir. Something, um, something for everyone here. All right, let's get into the fighting. Tyler Denny beats Felix Cash. Um, Tyler Ken Tyler Denny, not known for his punching ability, runs his record to 22-3 and three with only one knockout, which really got my attention. Fight was stopped on cuts. Tell me what you thought of the fights and how'd you like Tyler Denny? He better be a good boxer because with one knockout in 20 plus fights, not a great ratio. No, well, first of all, the fight that stole that show was the fight before that, uh, Croc and Walker. We'll talk about that after this. But the main event, the main event was definitely the fight that you just talked about um, with Denny and Cash, uh, not Johnny Cash. Uh, but it was uh, it was it was a fight where Southport Denny, who has the title, he's a European uh, middleweight champion, and he fought Cash. Cash Cash looked bigger. First of all, Cash Cash really did look bigger in the ring. Uh, he's an awkward guy. Uh, he moves laterally, then comes at you unexpectedly. Very unorthodox. Not an easy guy to fight, and not an easy guy to to look good with. And and I thought, as soon as the fight started, Ken, the first thing I said to myself, I made a note actually. The first thing was, Denny should not chase him. He should set himself and be ready to time Cash coming in because he's like being at the beach. You time the waves. You want to ride a wave, you time the wave. And a guy like Cash who's unorthodox, you know, that's that's going in and out and he's moving to the side and bang, he's coming at you. You set your feet and you set yourself. Marco Antonio Barrera did that with Prince Ahmed. Prince Ahmed was a guy over across the pond who was undefeated. <laughs> he was, a, I think it was featherweight uh, or, or lightweight or featherweight. Um... But anyway, he was a world champion, really good puncher, very awkward, very unorthodox, big following. Uh, he, you know, he, he, very difficult style to deal with, very undefeated, obviously. And what happened with Marco Antonio Pereira, of course, a great fighter, he timed him. He timed him coming in when, when he came at him with those shots where other guys got caught surprised. By surprise, in this case, Hamed got caught with punches as he was coming in, leaving himself open. That's what wound up happening with Cash. You know, early on, he was giving Denny a little trouble. It takes, it takes, uh, it didn't go all that long. It, it, they got to cut it, got stopped in the fifth round. But it takes a while to to kind of adjust to a guy like this. But Denny did. He he timed him coming in, and when Cash. Cash for all his unorthodox, all his awkwardness, you know, which which did give him trouble, especially early on in the first round. When he comes at you, he comes at you leaving himself open with with a with a little bit of a gap, with a little bit of a hole. And you can fill that hole if you set the punch. And then he filled that hole. And uh he he was able to hurt him. I think it was the third or fourth round. Um and then and then there was a cut. And I got to tell you, the referee stopped it really fast. They went to the scorecards after four rounds, uh, accidental headbutt, uh, you go to the scorecards. And they had, I have no problem with it. They had Denny ahead. And I have no problem with that. But I, I did think that the referee stopped it really. There's been a lot worse cuts than that. I thought the referee really stopped it too fast. But I will also say that Cash didn't complain. He didn't complain. Um, I, you know, maybe he knew his number was up. He was getting a little discouraged. He was getting caught. Oh, maybe the guy was bothering him. I'm not in his body, but it, it just, he didn't complain. Uh, the fight got stopped. 
uh, and uh, I, I believe it was stop what in the fifth round. I believe it was. And yes, they they went to those scorecards. Okay, let's go to the one that has really got me excited. Fight of the year, Ken Crocker and Walker. Fight of the year go right for now. It. Oh, uh, jump first, right in. Crocker, taller, undefeated. Walker was the underdog, obviously, and um, really the potential fight of the year. Match from Eddie Hearn, tremendous job. Uh, Eddie, Eddie got another. Uh, another another great card. I mean, Matchroom, you know, he, he, he's trying to make up for what Frank Warren did to him. I'm kidding around, you know, over in Saudi, where Frank Warren uh, whitewashed him. Frank Warren, uh, uh, <laughs> Frank Warren's team. Uh, <laughs> and look, did. some of those fighters were borrowed. They weren't all their team. Of they course. were borrowed. They were borrowed. But... We we kid around, but it was and it was I'm a sure great that show. Eddie Hearn was laughing all the way back oh, to England, yeah. counting his money on the plane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, him and Warren. Look, they they're two they're the two top promoters, definitely over across the pond. But two oh, of the, for sure. But but I would say the two top promoters in the world. Period. Oh uh, yeah, a lot of people Defin- say, oh definitely. Listen, I, I know Aaron was there. I get it, but I'm 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 putting them both there. But anyway, what? A fight, taller man Crocker. I'm gonna From get Belfast. I'm, yeah, I, the fight was in England. I, he's supposed to. You're supposed to use your physical assets, and Walker was the shorter guy. He's supposed to get inside, and Crocker has the edge on the outside. But for the first three rounds, Crocker just covered up, put the earmuffs on, went into the big bull, and he allowed Walker to get inside. But he didn't use a jab. He didn't separate himself. Walker went to work. Walker just came in, mm-hmm. does what he does. You got to love Walker. Just comes in, throwing punches. And and nice, he's covered up too. You know, not wide punches. Nice short punches, body, head, mixing it up and cuts. Crocker is the bigger puncher. Crocker is stronger. Crocker was just, you can see he's the bigger guy in there. Every once in a while, Walker was out working him. Probably all fight for the most part. But Crocker would open up every once in a while with with a spurt of combination. Well placed, good combination with power, with power, and that that would win rounds for him. That even though he was getting outworked, that would win because at the end of the day, uh, you could say, "Oh, it's controversial." Walker got. I think they got it right, but I, I I'd love to see a rematch because Walker deserves it. I mean, I hated to see a loser. It was really that kind of fight. Be- and again, Walker's in and out working him. But Crocker, every once in a while, get just a little bit of, he would all of a sudden get a little space and open up with, with a combination that was harder, well-placed, and with a more effective puncher. And that carried, that carried rounds for him in, in spots uh, early on. I disagreed with the commentators that said the early rounds were all Walker. I didn't. I, I thought Crocker was landing the hard, was being outworked, as I said, but was landing the harder, cleaner punch. I'm giving them, I'm giving them some of those rounds because of that. So I disagreed with the commentator. They do, they do a good job, but I just happened to disagree with that. They were just looking at the the quantity. I was looking at the quality, and and even Patty Dunfin, who I love, he's the, I think he's the top Irish prospect out there right now and he's undefeated he he might wind up fighting crocker um that's gonna be a huge fight over there but he was he was ringside they talked to him Uh, everybody knows again full disclosure my good friend keith sullivan who's a lawyer for my for the dr atlas foundation that uh, helps people uh he he does all pro bono work him and my daughter who's a lawyer and keith and david berlin uh they all do pro bono work for my foundation they're good people uh keith is a lawyer he also manages fighters patty donovan is one of the fighters that he manages over in ireland and and uh andy lee is his trainer tremendous trainer former junior middleweight world champion Patty Donovan was sitting ringside, and I disagree with him. I love him. I, I, I think it's going to be a hell of a fight if he fights Crocker. I'm going to favor Donovan, but he's, he's going to get tested. It's going to be a heck of a fight. But I disagreed when they asked him who was winning, and him and the commentators all seemed to be on the side of Walker. Again, got to love Walker. 
Got to love his style, his approach, his guts. He is so gutsy. He is so tough. He just keeps coming and coming and coming. And he did all night long. Crocker deserves credit for his grit too because he was tested. I thought he was starting to get worn down a little bit. I tell you, it was a 10-round fight. If it was two rounds more, that favors Walker. It favors Walker. He was starting to wear down. That style, that's what that style's about. That style is about. It's not about looking pretty. It's not about getting, you know, an, an award for, you know, whatever, uh, GQ or be on the magazine Q, posing afterwards because you're probably going to have a couple of black eyes. It, it's, it's about wearing a guy. Pressure breaks pipes. And when fighters fight that way, they're looking to break people. And that's exactly what Walker was looking to do. And later in the fight, he started getting some of that. Those last three rounds... Those last three rounds, it was, uh, it was like it was like a thrill in the middle, Manila type thing. Ken, take my word. You know I don't freaking say things if I don't stand and believe it. Eight, ninth, and tenth rounds in this fight were unbelievable. Back and forth, unbelievable. Just, just a fight of the year. And and those three rounds. Uh, we should be seeing them. Somebody should be doing what Rob does with our podcast and clipping them and putting them out there because I'd watch them. I, I, I definitely would watch them again and again and again. That's how good they were. That's how damn good they were. At the end of the day, geography. The geography for the shorter guy with short arms should be inside. That was Walker's, Walker's geography. He got in there, but Crocker... He fought on the inside at the wrong geography, but he still was able to get enough room to land some good short shots when he had to. But then Crocker, he made an adjustment around the fifth round, and he took it outside and started using that height, started controlling the geography more on the outside, started jabbing. And he started, when he started doing that, he separated himself. He 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 had better rounds. He separated himself when he started doing that. And and Walker slowed down a little bit. There were some spots there where where his engine it never it never turns off, but it, it it throttled a little lighter for a little while. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden he hit the afterburner. Bang! And he got it going. He got it going again. And then even though Crocker was outside and he took some of those rounds uh, 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 that he needed to take with his jab on the outside, fighting it smart, using his physical assets where he needed to use them, Walker's pressure, like I said, those last three rounds really, really, really started to pay off. At the end of the day, that, uh, uh, all I can tell you is, for me, unless, unless like... Unless Ali and Frazier come back and do the drill in Manila all over again or, or something along those lines, um, I don't know if anything's going to match this fight uh, for fight of the year. I, I'd love to see a rematch, like I said. Uh, tremendous job uh, by both. That's it. Go on. Let's move. Let's That's move, perfect. Baby. Let's jump into the UFC. Uh one guy who stole the show for maybe not all the right reasons, but, but for certainly for his toughness and resilience, Antonio Trocoli uh, accepts a last-minute fight in Saudi with uh, Shara Magomedov, and he was in Miami the day before weigh-ins in Saudi Arabia, jumped in as a last-minute replacement for um, Jolton Lutterback, and jumps on a flight. Cuts the weight in 24 hours while flying halfway around the world. Makes weight. Unfortunately for him, uh, Magomedov took his head off and just completely boxed his ears in. But I don't even know how the guy made it. Number one, cut the weight. But number two, when you arrive halfway around the world, it just takes you several days to get on the right, to get your circadian rhythm, your sleep, everything. But credit to Trocoli for getting in there and uh, giving it a go. But my God, I hope the UFC rewards him because he took a, a lot of punishment from uh, Magomedov, who just looked phenomenal with his hands. How'd you like that one? I like Magomedov. He, first of all, I'm going to be the first to say this, all right? Uh, he is he is the UFC's version of Cinnamon. Anyone out there who don't know Cinnamon, uh, Sam, they're not a boxing fan. That is Canelo. <laughs> Canelo is Cinnamon. 
and Magmadorf is the MMA version of Cinnamon uh, with the red hair. Trocoli or Southpaw, he switches back and forth. Magomedov, 12-0. and 0, Now he's 13-0, and 0, I believe. Uh, first round, Magomedov got caught early and trapped on the fence. That was Trocoli's best shot. That was what he tried to do, to, to what Ken said, I think, uh, with, with knowing what he went through um, and how he suffered to get to this fight, you know, and what he might have had or didn't have in the, in the tank. And um, probably won the first round. Probably won the first round for me. Uh, just controlling time, uh, position, uh, boring. It was boring, but for him it was effective, I believe. Second round, you know, uh, a lot of kicks by Magomedov while moving on the outside. Uh, like a, to me, he was using his kicks like a fighter was using a, would use a jab uh, and the legs, uh, you know, to to control the outside. Trogoli, uh I thought should have used a jab on the outside during that period where he he didn't know what to do and he wasn't doing anything. Uh, instead of just you know standing there, I thought uh, Customato used to say to me, Teddy. And I would say to my fighters later on, uh, when in doubt, jab, you know. But you got to jab at the right distance, the right position. There's no doubt about that. But when in doubt, to the, for the most part, you can't come up with something, come up with a jab. Um, usually not a bad idea. Um, Trugley got in again, uh, you know, uh, trapping Magomedov again, uh, understanding that that was his, uh, that was maybe, you know, his, his best strategy that he could have, uh, trapped him against the, the fence. Uh, Magomedov committed a foul by holding the fence. I have to mention that, right, Ken? Uh, to oh, avoid- that was so egregious, and the announcers got it right. When, it, when something's that egregious, point right away, because he was going down, and that little change changes the trajectory of the whole fight. Guys use a ton of energy for a takedown. To not get it is a real kick in the ass. It's unfortunate. Yeah, that was... Look, I'm not saying Magomedov wouldn't have won. I think he would have won anyway. But um, but that that was that was tough. Yeah, you could see Trocoli, to your point about winning anyway, you could see when Trocoli at the, uh, in the second round, when he ran out of gas, it was hard to watch, right? He was just a punching yeah, bag. Yeah, it was and terrible. And he had nothing... Con- I, I have such a hard time watching yeah, those. Yeah, it was terrible. But, you know, these guys are tough, man. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was 1-1 after two rounds. It was 1-1. And then the third round, Magomedov, as we are just touching on, starts the round with, you know, separation and kicks. And um, he, you know, keeping Trocoli very hesitant. Uh, just as we just said, he was like a deer in headlights, you know, uh, yeah. standing, standing in front, not doing anything, getting broken down mentally and physically. He was discouraged. He was broken down. Again, what you touched on, how he got there, what he went through. Like he, he probably knew that he only had so much in the tank uh, and, and it had to, uh, the, everything had to go right. And, and it wasn't going right. And when it wasn't going right, unfortunately, it, he couldn't hide it. It showed. That's you know how right. some people right. show you on their face? Like some people can hide it. Some people can hide it and you say, I I didn't know that he was feeling so bad. Yeah, he's not yeah. feeling good. I didn't know that. I looked at him. He looked pretty good. This guy, you knew he wasn't feeling good. Just exhaustion, which you can understand. I mean, again, traveling or halfway around the world, just trying to get up and go for a run if I travel long distance takes it out of me. I, I feel awful for several days. So to get in there and fight world-class level right off the plane is just... But I think the UFC appreciates that and will reward the effort for showing up and keeping the fight on the card. And I think everyone recognizes that he was at a huge disadvantage. Massive. At the end of the day, uh, uh, a knee... Uh, beautiful, accurate. First, it started with a counter knee for Magomedov, uh, and and then it was uh, some beautiful, accurate strikes. Uh, at the end of the day, Magomedov fought a very precise and disciplined fight. Johnny Walker comes in with the normal uh, Johnny Walker uh, energy, flamboyance, and he's bouncing around and he's doing his thing. And uh, Vulcan Ozdemir immediately starts kicking the crap out of his legs and literally takes him apart in the first round. Two and a half minutes in, the fight's over and Johnny Walker is asleep. And 
Maybe the ref stopped in a stepped in a punch too late, but my God, he put him to sleep with that vicious uppercut uh, as Johnny Walker was going down. And I mean, credit to Volk and Ozdemir. I mean, before the fight, I heard Brandon Schaub saying if Walker wins, he could be a good matchup for Alex Perea. Literally minutes before this happened, and I think after that, after that shot that put him away, I think that. It was a good reminder to people that there are massive levels to this thing, and Johnny Walker is incredible, but when you get to that top level, all that jumping around and doing the uh, acrobatic stuff, there's no time, there's no energy for that. It has to be complete and 100% focused, and when you're not focused, and I've heard you talk about this before, when you lose focus for a split second, when a guy this good and this fast, and Vulcan Ozdemir reminded everyone, that, it, that that stuff doesn't fly in the at this top level. And I think that that was what stuck out to me is that Johnny Walker is awesome, but he ain't at that level of like world champion. Any day he could look good, but you have to be good for every second of these top level fights. And Ozdemir exposed him there. What'd you think? Yeah, first round Walker used leg kicks early. First of all, Walker looks so big. He, he just he's looks, huge you know, and he's so all big, muscle. So big, and it's not just about obviously about size. It's about what you do with whatever size you have and what's inside uh, inside of you too. But uh, first round Walker using leg kicks early, trying to take power punching ability away from um, Aust Ostermeyer and. Um, you know, Walker switches back and forth, lefty and right. Um, and, and like I said, he just, he, he looks so big. Uh, Ozdemir uh, was hurting Walker with, with combos right away and uh, body, uh, head and body punches. He dropped them with a left hook as Walker st uh, stood tall against the fence. And then he finished them with the punch you took. But it started with the left hook. But then he finished oh, yeah. them with the, the clean shot you talked about, um, where, first of all, he the referee was late getting in, uh, which can be really scary, really scary in those kind of spots. You got to – I know the refs do a good job, and it's a tough job in this business, but it's it's a life and death job sometimes. Uh, you feel that way if they yep. don't get in there That's on right. time. And he got in there a little late, but um, – and he's a good ref, but he got in there a little late. Uh, right up a card, knocked him out, uh, and um, – and then, of course, he took that unnecessary shot uh, by Ozdemir uh, as Walker laid there. Uh, that was scary. That was scary. But good striking ability by Ozdemir. Uh, legs are always set under him for power. And, and he strikes with power and combinations and always always well placed. So uh, I don't want to – I want to try to move fast. So that's – I'll leave it with that. And then we'll go to Gastelum and uh, Rodriguez. Yeah, well, Gastelum, um, Gastelum highlighted how impressive it is for Trocoli to come in and miss weight because Kelvin missed weight and then goes out and gets a unanimous decision. When this stuff happens, it puts his opponent, Daniel Rodriguez, in this case, in a terrible position because... How often do you see a fighter say, no, I'm not going to fight him because he missed weight. They get backed into a corner where they're now the bad guy if they don't take the weight, take the fight. But he takes the fight and he loses a unanimous decision, has a massive impact. But I will say, I saw Rodriguez post on social media that he signed a new six-fight contract and the UFC repaid him for staying in the fight and doing the right thing, although he took a loss. Losses don't mean in MMA necessarily what they mean in boxing. But Gastelum spent the whole post-fight press conference conference apologizing to Dana and um and the team at UFC which is which is what he should have done but nevertheless they don't Dana at the press conference was not happy with them whatsoever. This is the third time he's missed weight. Matter of fact, one of the times he missed weight, I forget it was who who it was against, but he missed weight by 10 pounds uh uh against Tyron Woodley in 2015. So Kelvin not in good graces with the UFC despite the win and you know making weight is that's just something that they don't tolerate and shouldn't be accepted and like I said it puts the opponent in a terrible position because now he's got to take the fight against someone who hasn't suffered the way he has and uh, in some cases gives him a huge unfair advantage he did get a little bit of extra money but these guys aren't necessarily fighting for a few extra bucks. 
they're fighting because they're passionate. They want to move up the rankings. And um, anyway, how'd you like the fight aside from the weight miss? It was a good fight. First of all, it was a good fight. And Rodriguez, you're right. I'm glad they took care of him. He's 37 years old. Uh, I That's one thing about Dana White now. People say, oh, yeah, but the certain guys make money. The other guys don't. All that stuff. Look, he's got the best brand out there because he makes good fights, number one. And uh, and I know you still can argue with them with, for what they do and all that. Uh, oh, I, I always want to see fighters get more. There's no doubt about it. And I've said that. But that that... That brand, that sport has been evolving and improving. And and the things that I like, we can always look at negatives, but the positives that I like is that Dana, from, from the beginning, has always had this bonus thing where he, where he, he rewards guys for great fights. He rewards guys for bonuses. You know, he takes care, and you just pointed out, you know, after that, what's he do? He gives them a four-fight contract. I think that's what you said, uh, four fights. I think but, six fights. I think it was right. six fights. All right, so six fights. So he gave him a contract for more fights. So so Dana does reward the guys. He does reward uh, their performance. He, he rewards their loyalty. He rewards their commitment. Uh, he rewards their toughness. You know, so so that that that's always important to see. But uh, first round, Gossam Lum was taking charge right away, pressing forward. His body did not look uh, as fit. The commentators brought that up. It looked a little soft. But I tell you what, his conditioner was good. And, and the commentators uh, were, were giving him credit for that because he was pressing a fight and he was able to have a gas tank to keep doing that. Um, I, I thought that uh, he was pressing for Rodriguez was on the outside, giving good look, uh, uh, ground, was on the, giving ground a little bit, uh, looking to counter Gastelum, looking to see if he could catch him because he understood Gastelum was going to be a little one dimensional coming forward and maybe you can catch him coming forward, you know, when, when a guy's coming the way you expect him to come straight in, uh, obviously it makes sense to do some countering, uh, to, you know, to, to try to uh, take advantage of his aggression in that way and hope it gets reckless. Uh, so Gaslam put on the pressure. He, he, he also threw some really good leg kicks. Um, he was in charge in the first round. I thought landing some, some good shots, uh, and and you know good 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 strikes. Uh, I, I like the way Gaslam was set to punch uh, with his legs under him uh, while striking uh, in the first round. Uh, so Rodriguez landed some nice combinations with about uh, I think it was about a minute left or so in in the first round, but it was Gaslam's round. Uh, and some very nice spots of of strikes by Rodriguez and Canis. He, he fought a good fight, Rodriguez. Uh, he he really did. Uh, they both did. It was it was a nice, solid fight. Second round, Rodriguez started using his jab well. Uh, it was all striking. I mean, obviously, if you're a boxing fan, you loved this fight because it was like a boxing match. Uh, to to, to a great extent. Uh, Gaslam tried to get in, uh, and Rodriguez was countering very well. Uh, just just, just a good, solid action both ways. Gaslam applying the pressure. Uh, he got a takedown, I think it was in the second round, uh, at the halfway point of the round. Rodriguez got back up uh, and started countering again while Gaslam was coming in again. Just a really good fight. Rodriguez was picking his spots. I thought very well with Canis. Uh, there was a great leg kick by Gastelum. Uh, you know, he he finished around strong, but Rodriguez went back to to placing uh, just nice, accurate, clean Canis. Uh, Gastelum wound up getting another takedown at the end of the round. It was a very close round. Cleaner strikes, I thought, went to Rodriguez. I gave the second round to Rodriguez because of that. I had it 1-1 going into the final round. And um, again, Rodriguez, nice combinations while Gastelum continued to apply the pressure, hoping that he was going to wear down Rodriguez. Uh, 
Uh, Gaslam got closer, landed some big shots. Uh, he got another takedown, uh, which in the third round, at that point, it had him ahead in a round at the midway point. He was on top. He was in control with position. He had complete control. He won the fight right there, uh, doing damage with some ground and pound while he had him, and he was on top. Uh, Gaslam won a hard, solid, gritty fight. Uh, I thought at the end of the day, you could say whatever you want about the weight and about this, but his experience with top guys and obviously the way he applied pressure won the fight for him. Yep. Well, in the co-main uh, battle of Russian heavyweights, no love lost, seemingly Alexander Volkov, the giant. I thought they were friends certain... before the fight, Ken. I thought yeah. they were. I yeah. thought they were friends, and then at the end of it, that like you're alluding to, uh, obviously Pav Pavlovich was uh, not happy. No, uh, they were saying that they were acquaintances during right. their training days together, but never really friendly in hindsight, and they clearly didn't like each other. There was no love lost in the entire fight. Volkov put it on him all night long, uh, one-on-one-sided decision, 30-27 on two of the cards, 29-28 on the others. Uh, but my God, these guys both took a beating. They landed huge shots. It's shocking to me that this thing went the distance. But uh, like I said, stand up all day long. Volkov wins the fight, goes over to say, uh, congrats, bury the hatchet with Pavlovich. Pavlovich wasn't having it, gave him a hard shove to the chest. Very uh, uncharacteristic for any UFC fighter to um, still have a grudge after the fight. But these guys must have had some kind of history that wasn't talked about. Awesome fight, though. I loved every second of it. Volkov gets the win. What'd you think? I didn't think they had a history, but what do I know? I didn't think. I thought it was just... You know, maybe the kind of fight that it was. But um, yeah. I, I, I was a little surprised. I didn't think that there was any bad blood going into that fight. But at the yeah. end of the day, what did I think? I thought that Volkov is very tall. All right? That's what I thought. I thought he was very tall and that one to fight for him. He, he used his physical asset of being tall, which you should use if you're tall and you, you know, and you, you, you happen to be born with that asset. Uh, he, he, for the most part, he he knew where he needed to be and where he needed not to be. He needed to be on the outside with a really good punch and strong, shorter Pavlovich, and and he he was for the most part he was. He used his legs, his jab, his reach, uh, to stay on the outside, and and control the geography of the fight. I mean, that's for me. That's how he. That's how, and he's built like a puncher. He's wiry. He gets that leverage in the punches. We know Pavlich is a really good puncher. Um, Volkov fought a smart fight. You know, he, he fought the fight that he needed to fight given the physical advantages that he held over Pavlovich, uh, where he was, you know, on the outside, uh, used his jab. Uh, you know, he. Uh, Pavlovich, I'll give him credit. When he was pressing forward, he did try to press behind the jab, which is the right thing to do. Watch Mike Tyson when he was young. Always the shorter guy. He pressed behind jabs and take away the jab of the taller guy. You should not forego your jab just because you're shorter and take for, and in your head say, oh, I can't out-jab the guy. He's taller. He's longer. No, you can't. And, and even if you don't out-jab him, at least you put bugs on the windshield. At least you give him something to make him defensive, to, to think about, to worry about, so he doesn't just have his field day with his jab. And Pavlovich, when he did do it, I thought he did it pretty good when he was pressing forward with the taller opponent, um, you know, trying to keep him from pot-shotting him uh, as he came, came in. Uh, both of them were... Obviously, both of them were being careful, respectful, if you will, that uh, for the other one's abilities, that no one wanted to make a mistake. But Pavlovich, uh, Pavlovich uh, was applying the pressure, uh, being a shorter guy, being a the, he he understood he had to be close to deliver that power. He was the guy applying the pressure, trying to get close, and also trying to wear down, you know, Volkov. Uh, I I thought that Pavlovich should should have in spots. I would have loved to see him bend low and then throw high. Little trickery, little trickery. If I was in a corner, I would have said, you know what? 
Volkov is tall. I think you figured that out by now. Bend low like you're going to go to the body and then throw something high. You might just catch him standing tall. But that never that never came to fruition. That never never happened. Uh, Volkov, I thought there were spots where he, he needed to jab uh, a little bit more. Uh, you know, because that was, for me, that was the big edge for him. Uh, Volkov being able to use his height and use his reach. Uh, the first round, I gave it to Volkov. Uh, it was one nothing. Second round, Pavlovich was applying more pressure. Obviously, he had no choice. That was the way he was going to win the fight, by trying to trying to get in close. I thought it was 2 nothing uh, after two. Again, battle of geography. Volkov won that battle. Uh, I thought that uh, the third round that Pavlov that Volk uh, Pavlovich needed to sell out a little bit, you know, to to try to obviously have to take more risks to try to get in, and uh, obviously you could get caught when you're trying to do that. But I thought he was in a position where if he's going to win a fight, he had no other choice. But um, Volkov used his jab a little bit more. Uh, he used some good, some good kicks. Uh, one time I even saw Volkov hook off his uh, jab. I love to see that. I love to see a guy that works off the jab and makes the jab talk, you know, a little bit by, by doing things off of it. Uh, he, he didn't do it much, but he, uh, he caught my eye when he did it. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it was a it was a fight that was a smartly disciplined, very disciplined, strategic fight that was fought by Volkov, uh, where, as I said earlier, where he knew he had to win the battle of geography, and he won the battle of geography. Nice disciplined win for Volkov. Yep. And in the main event, Bobby Knuckles puts it on Ikram Aliskarov. Um if you noticed quickly uh, in the one and a half minutes that the fight took place, Bobby Knuckles threw a couple feints, two in a row, and he got Ikram to expose his counter, which was to try to kick on the uh, one-two. And Bobby Knuckles timed it perfectly, comes in and cracks Ali Skarov. And once he had him hurt, he goes back against the fence, and Whitaker finishes him with a beautiful uppercut. Just shocking results in the grand scheme of things. And... Uh, Bobby Knuckles continues to prove why he's like always in the top there, always contending for the title. Um, awesome performance by Bobby Whitaker. Uh, how'd you like it? Yeah, look, Al Alice Kurov was in a tough spot. He took the fight on short notice. He was in a tough spot because Whitaker is like this. He fought a really close, tight fight with Duplessis. That was a close fight. Yes, when when yeah. he you know Very. when he lost to Duplessis, yeah, and Duplessis is a is a big monster. He, he fought a really, really tight fight with him, right? When, uh, the top middleweight, and then the top middleweight, uh, Adesanya, our friend who. I love having him on the show. I, I love what he is, who he is, everything about him. Uh, the first fight with Adesanya, the, you know, Adesanya being a special talent that he is, a uh, special champion that he was. And, and that's, hey, look, uh, saying all that, that's not, I'm not going to leave out, uh, I'm not going to leave out, I'm, I'm lapsing on his name right now. The man who beat Whitaker the last time. Uh, not beat Whitaker, who beat um, Adesanya. Um, uh, Strickland. Strickland. Strickland, of course. Th let's not forget about him. But I just want to say that I wanted to make a point that Whitaker's resume, you know, on his, 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 you look at his record of guys that he's fought, and, and even with the with the losses, he he loses to Duplessis in a really tough, close fight, number one. And then the first fight with Adesanya where he gets stopped, a lot of people kind of forgot he had been sick for like a year. And he had come back, and I don't think he was really fully back yet. And so he loses that fight 
to Adesanya, the great Adesanya. But then he fights him in the rematch, and man, that was a close fight. Man, that was a close fight. Uh, so I just wanted people to really, I'm sure the fans out there already understand it because they're, they're knowledgeable uh, MMA fans, but Whitaker is damn good. He is one of the most solid fighters out there uh, at middleweight, obviously, but anywhere. Um, he is... He is technically so damn good. I don't think there's... He doesn't make mistakes, really. I don't think there's anything that he really can't do. Um, so, Alice, Alice Garoff, on short notice, was in a top spot. And Whitaker was... You could see he was focused. He he comes in there... You could see he's putting that mean face on, as the commentators alluded to. But he gets himself into a frame he needs to get himself, a mental frame that he needs to get himself in. You can see it. He, he's coming down that, that walkway, putting himself into a, a mental, you know, position that he, and, it's, and, and you can see what works for him. He's a really good guy, nice guy, but it works for him to get him into that meanville. He gets into meanville, and he was in meanville, and when he's in meanville, uh, you wind up being in Hurtville. And <laughs> Alice Garoff was in Hurtville. Uh, you know, it, it was in short order. In short order. Uh, like I said, he just so solid. He used the kicks early to the leg. Well placed. Um, you know, doesn't really... He, 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 he doesn't waste much either. Um, he used his jab well in pressing the fight. And then, of course, he uh, he just destroyed Alice, Alice Goff, uh with that first round KO. Right hand hurt him. Uh, then the uppercut finished him. Uh, he he chose the right punch. You know, everyone sees the uppercut that it finished him, and but he he's got the eyes, the calmness in an uncalm environment. That's part of what makes him great. To choose exactly the right punch, you know, and. It was the right punch because that was the punch from the direction it comes from, the uppercut, where Alice Garoff never expected it. He he just Al Alice Garoff just it was it was the perfect punch. And um just experience, good eyes to make the right choice for Whitaker. The and again the the, the punch that started it was a beautifully timed right hand. He stepped in just as Alice Goroff was starting to kick. Again, that's what I mean about him being so solid. He saw him start to kick. He steps in perfectly placed right hand that started the whole problem for Alice Goroff. Um, just what striking and boxing is all about. Uh, used the jab to blind him for the uppercut. Uh, and then, you know, it was all over. Uh, he never saw... He never saw that punch. So anyway, I I just wanted to make sure that I gave him uh, not that I have to give Whitaker's dues, but it was it might have been a one round blowout. I guess is what I want to make sure people understand. But it's only a one round blowout because of the way he takes care of his business, because of the way he did it, because of all those little things I just mentioned timing the kick or that's what made it a one round blowout all right espn card teddy uh let's cover that quickly for the hardcores out there yeah Isley and martinez we'll start with that all right um yeah uh brian mcintyre uh, bo mac uh, as he's known one of the top trainers he trains crawford he's in a corner Isley, and uh, i'll tell you uh, bo mac I, I haven't seen him with a fighter that doesn't know how to fight uh, there's something to be said about that. Uh, Robert Garcia was the trainer with Martinez. Garcia, former world champion, top trainer too. So you had two top guys in the corner. Uh, Isley is uh, shorter, more compact. Martinez is a southpaw. He's taller. And uh, first round, really nothing happened until the end when Isley finished strong. Uh, like I said, short, compact, physically strong. He covers up really well. Hard to get a real clean shot on him. I was very impressed with Isley. 
Uh, I'm going to cut right to the chase. Uh, uh, I'm going to break down the fight in short order, but I was just very impressed with how solid he was. He, he is a solid, aggressive boxer. Yeah, that, that's how I describe a guy like him. Yeah, he, he looks to be aggressive. He's short. He's, you know, he's built good. Uh, he'll look to get inside, go to the body. He places well-placed shots, you know, educated shots. But he's a aggressive boxer because he does the things that a top box has to do. He's responsible defensively. He, he, he'll he mix in, he'll come at you, but then he'll go in and out, he'll give you angles. There's a lot to him. He is a, uh, you better be able to fight, um, and you you better be getting paid good if you fight nicely because it is not going to be, I don't care who it is, he is the guy that caught my attention, uh, really caught my attention. I had never seen him before. He really impressed me. Uh, it was a, uh, It was a fight where Martinez really didn't do anything into the third round, uh, where he finally started moving his hands, throwing punches. First two rounds, he just basically covered up, you know, put the earmuffs on, as I like to say. Uh, But then he started coming forward. I, I thought that Martinez didn't have a good strategic fight plan for the physical assets he had. He was taller, he was longer. Uh, Well, I don't know if he was longer, but he was definitely taller. And I thought he should have been on the outside using those abilities. And instead, he just covered up, made it easy for the shorter Isley to get in, to get right to him, to get right to his body. And Martinez, being a southpaw too, he he didn't use that southpaw advantage on the outside using that southpaw jab. He 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 went when he finally got going in the third round. He just went right to Isley and started fighting fire with fire, and it made for good. It made for a nice uh, action, you know, where he was just fighting with Isley on the inside, and he was doing some good work, placing some good body shots, you know, putting some nice combinations together. Uh, he was doing a good job. But I just thought he would have done a better service to himself if he took it on the outside and and used the jab on the outside. Um, basically, uh, he was emulating Isley. He was like doing this, fighting the same fight as Isley. The problem for me was he doesn't have the same equipment as Isley, you know, from a physical standpoint. He's taller. He should be on the outside a little more. Um, so... I just thought Isley was more consistent on his offense until the fifth round when Martinez stepped it up. Uh, But Isley finished the fifth round well. Again, he does a good job of throwing educated punches, placing them to the body and the head, and using the uppercut in there really well while showing his defensive capabilities of being defensively. If you're going to be an aggressive fighter, you better be good defensively for the most part. And he is. He really is. Um, it was the type of fight that best fit fitted uh, Isley's physical abilities on the inside. And while I was watching, I was saying, I don't, as much as Martinez is working now, and he's working pretty good, I, I just, I think he's in the wrong place. I don't think he's winning this fight with this guy on the inside. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, Isley gets the, Wins the fight. Uh, Seventh round, Martinez got a point taken away uh, for Lopo. Uh, Both fighters, both fighters wound up, I believe both fighters wound up getting a point uh, taken away uh, for low blows. There there was a lot of inside fighting going on, a lot of work around the belt line that was going around. I, I believe, I want to see if I made a note to myself. I don't want to give inaccurate information. I hate when inaccurate information is given. But um, I I thought they both had a point taken away. Uh, but anyway, that's the way the fight went. On the inside, a lot of inside work. Uh, could see that by the end of the eighth round, the kind of fight that, Martinez chose to fight Ken um, and the fight that Isley was equipped to fight. 
I thought I thought Martinez got forced into the wrong fight. And by the eighth round, you could see Martinez will was starting to get beaten, starting to get faded a little bit. Uh and and take it out of him a little bit. Uh again, lots of low blows. Uh yeah, I made a note to myself I'm accurate. Both fighters had a point taken away. Uh uh, Isley was won again for a low blow. Uh, but by the ninth round, Isley was in complete control of the tempo of the fight. And Martinez was impressive to me with his ability to to fight both aggressively and smartly. Um, or I'm sorry, not Martinez, uh, Isley. Just to fight aggressively and smartly, I was very impressed with the way he was able to do that. And like I said, mix it in with, with countering in spots, using his legs to get angles in spots. Um, just good, solid boxing in an aggressive form uh, was was really... And he, he, he put himself on my list of fighters that I'm, that I'm interested in, that I'm watching. Great performance by Isley. Just a solid, solid fighter. Yeah. Awesome show. Was there um, was there anything else on that card you wanted to touch on? Well, you had to you had Cortez and Nova, and uh, Nova's a good kid. I, I I root for this kid. And talking about geography, talking about where you should be fighting your physical assets. Cortez is twenty one and zero. Now he's twenty two and zero. Nova Nova's got a couple losses. Um, he's got two losses, and he's thirty years old. And I. I'm I'm not favoring anyone, but I'd be lying if I didn't say I wasn't rooting for Nova. Uh, he he's a he's a good kid, and he brings a mascot into the ring with him. How many guys bring a mascot? You know what I mean? <laughs> bring, <laughs> I like that. And, yeah, and uh, Cortez came in overweight, and you never like to see that. It's not professional, and he paid money for it, but he came in overweight. You know, he got away with it. Uh, he paid money, and Nova is longer and taller, and he should have owned the outside, but but he's a game fighter, gutsy fighter. He was in great shape. You could see the body difference. Nova was in better shape than Cortez, and Nova, even though I thought he should have been owning the outside, uh, starting with the jab and using his legs to keep that range, he 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 went for it. You know, he, he went into the... the the Lions then. He went into Cortez's territory. Cortez is shorter. He's a guy, you know, long shorter arms. He's a guy who wants to be on the inside. Uh, I'm saying shorter arms. Again, I don't know if he has short arms, but he, he's a guy that wants to fight on the inside. That That is his thing. Uh, if he's going to win fights and he's won 22 of them now, that's where he's going to get most of the work done. And I, I thought Nova, you know, accommodated him maybe a little too much but at the end of the day no there was like maybe a little method to his madness because Nova started wearing Cortez down a little bit where you could see he was his condition was better and even though he was fighting on the inside where I thought he had an advantage on the outside he was starting to get the better of on on the inside uh there was sloppy fights in a fight Definitely, there was too much grabbing in spots on the inside, but there was also some spots where they fought good on the inside, uh, away from the sloppy parts. And there was also parts where Nova can started using his jab on the outside. And when he did that, well, I thought he just made it clear that he should have been doing more of that because it worked for him. Um, it worked for him. Uh, you could see Cortez was trying to time him coming in as he came in. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Nova was Nova started when in the sixth round, Nova was active on the outside, uh, and he you could see the distinct edge that he had when he did fight on the outside. He he should have done more of it. He should have done. He just should have done more of it. Uh, the eighth round fight was 
a bit sloppy in spots. At times, uh, there was good inside work, but at times there was just a little too much grabbing uh, and smothering going on. Uh, it came down to the stretch where Nova just basically started out working Cortez uh, at his own game, like I said earlier, on the inside. And um, he fought a very hard and determined uh, t- determined fight. He really did. Uh, by, and in the eighth round, I thought he just outworked. I thought he just outworked Cortez in his territory. Uh, the ninth round, the corner of Nova uh, gave some simple advice. It doesn't get more simple than this, Ken. You know, I like to hear some technical stuff in there sometimes, right? But sometimes, you know, you just get the simple stuff. And it was basically, go out there and just F him up. So that's pretty basic. <laughs> I figured I'd mention that. Sam, Sam, Aye. enjoy that. So, um, not, like I said, not a lot of technical advice, but um, the message was received. And um, it was all inside work. Nova, Nova showed that he was in better shape. Uh, Cortez kept trying to catch him with a big shot. Uh, you know, but uh, hard fought. Sloppy, like I said, in spots. Hard fought. Nova took charge in the ninth. Uh, so hungry. Was You can see how hungry he is. Uh, trying to beat the undefeated fighter. It was a real, the ninth was a really good round. Uh, I thought the tenth round would tell a story, possibly, although I, I had Nova ahead. Uh, I, I had Nova ahead just being busier. Uh, the tenth round... Uh, I thought Nova took it. Uh, I thought he was scoring with the jab early, as he should. Cortez came forward, but he wasn't really getting where he wanted to get. Uh, Nova was controlling the outside, countering, uh, catching him coming in. Uh, I, I actually, I thought Nova won the fight. I thought Nova, and I was happy for him for about yeah. one minute until I heard the scores. <laughs> but um, I, I was happy. I. I thought that he, um, you know, he had lost his last fight for the title. I think it was his last fight. And um, he had been knocked out a few fights before that. But tonight, he made up for it all. And he got it done. Uh, I thought they robbed him. Uh, I, yep. they, gave, they gave it to the, you know, they gave it to the A-side again. And, um, you know, to the undefeated fighter who was 22-0. And and that's why you got to listen. I want you guys to listen to the interview we have uh, at the end of the show with uh, that that we that we have with the owner of of, of uh, Pro Box, uh, Gary Jonas. And Gary Jonas is uh, the owner of the television uh, entity Pro Box, and they've been doing fights for about two years now. Competitive, good fights down in Florida that have been broadcast on their network, on ProBox. And look, full disclosure, I said it during the interview, I I got hired there eight months ago. But I wouldn't be saying what I'm saying just because I'm hired there. I'm only saying, I, I'd say nothing. I, I, I wouldn't be disparaging. But I wouldn't say what I'm saying now if I didn't believe it. Uh, it it's a... I like working for Pro Box. We do boxing news. I work with two of the smartest uh, guys in boxing, with Paul, Paulie Malinacci and Chris Algieri, two former champs. But Gary Jonas, what he has created there over the last two years, he's got an arena down in Florida. They put fights on every other Wednesday, and they broadcast them on Pro Box. They put good competitive fights on. Uh, and he does the matchmaking. He does not allow a guy. He doesn't. Into the ring, if he's got a track record of being a grabber, a runner, he's all he's looking at tapes, him and his matchmakers, and they're only putting on fights that figure to be fights that you, the fans, want to see. And you know what? It's working. It's actually working. And he's putting on a a world title fight with Lamont. Roach against McCrory. Lamont Roach is the is the junior lightweight champion of the world. He's fighting in D.C. in his home crowd uh, on Friday on Pro Box. But we did an interview 
with the founder of ProBox. I, I ask you to watch it. I really think that um, you're going to learn something. You're going to learn something about what his plans are and their plans to make this sport uh, more exciting. Uh, the, the same way Alice Sheik, Turkey Alice Sheik is doing, but obviously on uh, not on the level of being able to pay, you know, <laughs> the millions and millions and millions and $20 million, $50 million to make a fight that we all want to see. But on a level where he's week in and week out, out putting on solid fights that you want to see. So anyway, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to say that um, because this was a perfect example because what the formula that, Gary Jonas is using is no A side against the B side where the promoter has an interest in the A side so therefore you see them get to decisions right uh, let's yep. face it that's right but that's he right. The, I call it there's only one side the fan side the way it should be no A side no B side and you saw at work again in this fight with Nova and Cortez the A side against the B side. The A side got the decision. The A side did not deserve that decision. I thought the B side, Nova, deserved the decision. Um, and unfortunately, that's how boxing works. Uh, unfortunately, as much as we're trying to fix it. So, close rounds. I will tell you that. I thought there were close rounds. But I thought that Nova outworked him down the stretch to earn the fight. So, and we go on to the next boxing, which I talked about at the top, Ken. A star is born. Rafael Espinosa. Yeah, that was uh, Espinosa against, um, what the Chirino. hell is his name? Chirino. Chirino. Yeah, hell of a fight. Fight of the year candidate. Let me tell you something. Chirino's not chopped liver. He, he's now 22-2. and two. He's a good, solid fighter. And Espinosa treated him like, like he didn't even belong in the ring with him. I mean, yep. uh, you talk about impressive. Wow. He, he just, oh, my. Espinosa was incredible. He's, I talked about it at the top. Espinosa... Has the is the tallest featherweight in the history of boxing. That's saying something because boxing been around a hell of a long time, and he's yeah. six foot one. And that's crazy. Th it's crazy. Th it, it's it's crazy. That weight. Ken, there's been nobody. The only guy who comes to mind, and he wasn't near six one. But when I talk about a great, f well, first of all, the power that Espinosa comes with being wiry, the, the talk, the, the leverage that he gets in his punches. But when you, when I'm talking about a featherweight that's big, that's big and has power, I'm going all the way back to the 40s and I'm thinking about the great Sandy Sadler. If you have a record that is 144 and 16 with two draws and 103 knockouts, I'd say you were great. I would say you're great. <laughs> and you're never going to see those errors. You're never going to see those numbers because those error, errors in boxing will never exist again. The best fight and the best every week and, and fights going on every week where guys could get 144 wins and you ain't seen it no more and Sa Sandy Sadler had an incredible series with what some people say is the greatest featherweight of all time a man named Willie Pep his record was 229 wins 11 losses and one draw and he was the will of the wisp well he was some people think he was one of the if not the greatest alley all those but the greatest boxer technician of all time legendary has it that he once won a round without throwing a punch. <laughs> just just by navigating the ring, using his legs, you know, ring generalship, making the guy miss, he won a round without throwing a punch. Willie Pep, if not the greatest featherweight of all time, he's right there, and Sandy Sadler is right there with him. Sandy Sadler won their series. They fought four times. Sadler won three of them. Pep won one um, with, with a decision. But 
I to bring me back to bring me back to think about Sandy Sadler, the two time featherweight champion of the world, one of the greatest featherweights of all time, just because of Espinosa's power, his size, just to even make me think about Sadler. Wow. I I just I just had to make sure I I give him his I give him his flowers, like my son would say, that he gets his flowers. Uh I've said many times, and now I, I noticed the commentators were using it, saying, Oh, you know, uh, a fighter wins the title, he improves thirty percent. Uh I, I never heard anyone really say it until I brought it back. A couple of years ago, I was talking about it, and and the MMA guys talk about it now and everything. I didn't start that. Customato started that. He told me that. Now I heard the commentators the other night say Gil Clancy. Gil Clancy was a great trainer. Gil Clancy trained Emil Griffith, amongst others. Gil Clancy was uh, Emil Griffith was middleweight champ, great fighter, and Gil Clancy was a great commentator, great commentator, and. Um, they said that he said it. I don't know. Maybe they're right. I'm wrong. I thought the guy really who coined that was Customato, but at least for me. Uh, but Espinosa is proof that that saying, winning a title improves you 30% automatically. It, it was there to be seen. It was there to be beholden. It was there to be believed when you saw how much better as Spinoza was in his fight from his last fight. And his last fight was to win the world title. And he didn't get, sometimes with all the belts out there, the proliferation proliferation of belts out there, too many belts, too many belts. Uh, but with all of those belts out there, you can get an easy spot sometimes. You can. Espinosa fought for the title in a very tough spot. A real t- against a really good world champion, against against Robesi, uh, Robesi, Ro- Ro- yeah, Robesi. I'm sorry, Robesi Ramirez, and Robesi Ramirez is a hell of a fighter. Two time gold medalist from the Olympics. Uh, how many guys you know that done that? Not too many. Lomachenko, few others, very few, very few. He is a hell of a fighter, and it was a hell of a fight. And he had to earn it. He got dropped in the fifth round. He got off the floor with Ramirez. And he came back to drop Ramirez in the 12th and almost knock out Ramirez uh, to win that title. uh, I'll say it again. A star is born. This, This guy, he does, he is exciting. He can punch like hell. He's, he, he, he's tall. If he wants to fight on the outside, he can. But he he is so much a fighter that he goes and he fights on the inside. I think he's going to have to learn to fight and be a little more consistent on the outside as he fights the top guys uh, if he wants the state champion, which I think he has a chance to do. But uh, he, he goes and fights you. And that's why we love him. And that's why I'm talking about him. Uh, he, he, he goes to get it done. And the way he timed that uppercut, he timed, Sergio Torino was fighting the right fight. He was moving, he was pot shotting, he was trying to keep the taller guy off balance. And Espinosa timed him with a beautiful punch inside a punch. He saw that Sergio Torino was throwing something wide and he stepped right inside it with, a, with an uppercut. I, I mean, you don't see that too often. You really don't. And it was just so beautifully done. Uh, he, yeah, he stands a little too tall sometimes, I think. I already told you at the top that I think that in a way, they should t- stay away from in a way for a while. I think in a way, is, uh, even though in a way would be moving up again, I think that he would take advantage of, of Espinosa at this point, standing too tall and making himself a target and giving him a lot of body to attack. But I, anytime Espinosa is fighting, I'm marking it on my calendar. I want to see this guy. And I'll finish with this, Ken. Yeah, it was the uppercut that did the damage. Yeah, it was the power that that made us go, wow. Wow! From a tall guy like that. But for me, it was the jab. 
It was the long jab that got the work done, that set everything up, that kept Chirino in trouble where he couldn't get a rhythm going. Chirino knew what he had to do. He knew it was a tall order, and no pun intended, but he knew that that it, it was a tall order. He knew that he had to move, he had to pick spots, he had to keep this guy off balance, and he was trying to do that. But Espinosa knew it too, and Espinosa showed he's more than a tall guy. He's more than just a puncher. He used his jab. He used his jab to keep to stabilize Chirino on the outside, to keep Chirino from having his way on the outside where he could move in and out whenever he wanted to and he could pot shot whenever he wanted. He used it to keep him off balance. He used it after he hurt him to keep him discombobulated. He used it the same way George Foreman, the great George Foreman, Used his jab. His jab, of course, is a foam pole, but it was a good jab. It was strong. It was hard. It was accurate. It was straight. But he used, Espinosa used his jab the same way as George Foreman used his in the first Joe Frazier fight. Yeah, he caught Joe Frazier with the uppercut the same way as Espinosa caught Sharino with that devastating uppercut. But then... George Foreman went to the jab that never allowed Joe Frazier to get back, to get back in the fight, kept him off balance, kept him hurt, kept him, as I said before, discombobulated and until the next uppercut was going to land again. And that's exactly what caught my eye as a trainer, why I'm giving these, these accolades to Esper, not because of his power, not because he's the tallest featherweight of all time, because the way that he mixed in power with with good technique, with 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 guile, with with strategy, with a great jab that never allowed Sharino to get any rhythm going, never allowed him to recover. That jab was as impressive as the uppercut was. That jab was just a he's going to need it if he's going to keep this title. That jab really got my attention. And I, I, like I said, you don't hear me say it too often. Anytime Espinosa, Ken, if I don't catch it, call me up. Yep. Call me up and say, Ted, uh, Espinosa's fighting because I will be sure to be there. He looked great. He looked scary good. Yeah, excellent. Um, before we go today, I just want to give a um, quick preview of the upcoming Perea Prohaska fight for our friends at MyBookie. And if you're going to bet on the fight, go to MyBookie.ag and use the promo code ATLAS to get a 50% credit on your first deposit. Again, MyBookie.ag. Teddy, let's preview the fight, but keep in mind the line on this fight is minus 180 for Alex Perea. And plus 140 for Yeri Prohaska, uh, over under one and a half rounds, minus 200, under plus 142. With that in mind, what are you looking for in this fight, and who do you like? Look, that's what makes the MMA the king right now, and why it makes UFC in particular, I should say, the king. The fights fell out one after another. One after another. It started with Conor McGregor, and then it, went, it was like an avalanche. It was like a domino effect. Just one fight after another falling out. And then what do you replace it with? In boxing, sometimes you replace with stuff that really, quite frankly, you're not interested in. But not in UFC. Pereira and Brahovic. Uh, just, just incredible. Now, it's a rematch. Pereira won the first one. But let me tell you something. He won by knockout. Pereira has one of the purest left hooks, counter left hooks. He is a... Punches are born. They're not made. They're born. Pereira's a puncher. And Prohavchuk um, is coming off a really good win. I think he was the underdog. A really good win. And he's a, I love Prohavchuk. I love both guys. But I love him, yeah. his style. He, he, he is coming to get you. He is a house on fire. He is a man determined. He is a man that that is, uh, you know, he, he he is committed to to finding a way to get. But I think he's starting to tone it down to be a little smarter, a little more mature, where he's not quite as reckless. And he's going to have to be that. 
if he's going to beat Pereira, he got caught coming in. He was, he was having real good moments where you might even say he was winning the fight, but he was having moments, really good moments in that fight with Pereira in their first really good, catching him going back, catching him big shots, but then he got a little reckless. He forgot how strong a left hook he had, and he forgot how good a counterpunch he is. And Pereira caught him with the right hand and finished with the left hook as Povacic came in careless, a little reckless, reaching in a little bit from two ways, prone to do, from two, and he got caught. I think in this fight he's going to be better. He's going to be, he's going to, and both guys took it on short notice. Like I said, I give, I give credit to you. They always, no matter what fight falls out, they wind up coming up with a winner. And that's why the brand is what the brand is. But I think he's going to have to be smarter, a little bit more controlled with his aggression, not so reckless. I think that he showed me some of that in his last fight that he won. Uh, he's going to have to show me more of that, uh, where he's going to have to be more patient coming in, controlled coming in. Use his jab, maybe some feints once in a while to get uh, to make sure the coast is clear that he's not walking into any counter shots. Um, I think it's going to be a hell of a fight. I think oh, it's yeah. going to. I think it's going to be. Uh, the first one was competitive. Like I said, he he was having his moments till he got caught. I think that this fight will be a tight fight. A lot tighter than you might think right away when you see when you hear minus eight hundred. I I think it. I really do. I think it will be. At the end of the day, both these guys are explosive. Both these guys are obviously offensive fighters. Both these guys are strikers. Um, Pereira's got not only a left hook; he's got a great jab, and everything is hard. Every and he's got that great background in kickboxing. Great background in kickboxing that really serves him. But everything is hard. Pavacic might want to take him to the floor, although Pereira has developed a good defense, a takedown defense, which you have to do in this business if you're primarily a striker. Uh, just to be just to be clear on one thing, I think you said minus 800. Pereira is a minus 180 favorite. One, uh, to uh, 180, I'm sorry. 44. I'm uh, sorry. Prosper. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. Thank you. For, it was, uh, no, thanks for cleaning that up. All right. Yeah, no well, look, uh, that shows it's you right still there. Still almost two to one favorite. Yeah, this and, is the second fight. Yeah, and I'll and I'll be honest with you, that's a lot smaller than than maybe a lot of people would have thought it was going to be. Really, including me, including me, because after he got knocked out and Pereira being the monster, of knocking out a hole after that. And, and being yep. a monster that he's shown himself to be, uh, I, I would have thought the line would be bigger. I would have thought the line would yeah. be bigger. But that shows you the respect they have for Prohaska and how good Prohaska looked in his last fight. Um, That's right. Having, That's right. Ha having said all that, having said all of that, I tell you, it, it's not going to be an easy out for anyone, and it ain't going to be an easy out for the champ, for Pereira. Um but I'm still gonna go with the champ. I'm still gonna go with the guy that yeah, I'm with you. That punches the way he does. See, the thing with Perez, you can't make mistakes. Perazka right. could be winning a fight, the whole fight, and one mistake, bang, lights out. That's exactly. So at the right. end of the day, I think it's gonna be a very good fight, and I, I'm going with Pereira. I'm with you. Well. That's a very thorough breakdown, and we'll look forward to breaking down all the action when you're back from Vegas. Uh, thorough show today. We covered all the fights, so we got a little something for everyone in here. But um, please, if you're watching the show on YouTube, subscribe to the show. It helps us out immensely, and we'll see you guys next week. Everyone, have a great week. Thanks, Teddy. Look forward to hearing about your trip to Vegas, seeing your grandkids, and everything that goes along with it. Have a good one, guys. Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout joined as always by the voice of all combat sports and today we've got a very special guest. I'm going to let Teddy do the introduction. Teddy take it away. Yeah Gary Jonas uh, founder of Pro Box Television and full disclosure we always do full disclosure. Um, why wouldn't we? You got to always be up front. Gary hired me on Pro Box about my I'd say about eight months ago, 
And um, so I work there, so I want everybody to know that. I would be interviewing Gary even if I did not work for ProBox. And people that know me know that if I say it, that I think they can trust that it's true. Um, I think my reputation allows for that. Uh, I would do it because he is a pioneer. He is doing things now that, quite frankly, it's been about two years. I'll let him really color it all in in a minute. I want to give the backdrop of the proper introduction. But he is doing what Turkey Alice Sheik is doing in a larger form. But he started it earlier where he's making boxing relative again. He's making boxing important again. He's making good fights. He he is trying to change the formula. I've said it for years. It's not a complicated formula. Uh, Dana White has made it work. He has made it work to the tune of a $22 billion now. I think that's the value on, on UFC. Uh, it's somewhere in that neighborhood of the brand. And he did it by... Making good fights, competitive fights, fights that people want to see, fights that, you know, it's not an A side or a B side. There's one side, a fan side. And Gary's been doing that. He has an arena down in Plant City, Florida. He's got his base down there. He puts fights on every other Wednesday down there on Pro Box, and they are competitive wars. They are because again, it's not complicated. There, there's no A side or B side. There, there's no dog in the race, no horse in the race. It's just good fights. And you know what? Prospects are coming out of there. Good, pro, good fights and good prospects. And again, I think that my reputation allows me to say it to the level that I'm saying it. That people know I wouldn't say it if I didn't deem it to be true. If I didn't know it to be true. I actually, I tell you a funny story. We were. We were doing our prospects of the year, and um, we were doing it for Pro Box, and I was putting together, doing my work like I always do, like any professional does when when they have a job. And I'm doing my, I'm going over tape, I'm going over fights that uh, a lot of people don't know, and I'm looking for the right guys, I'm looking for the prospect, and all of a sudden I look at Pro Box, and I hadn't watched Pro Box, again, I, I'm, I'm very straight about it. I hadn't really watched Pro Box. So I start watching it, and all of a sudden, I see these fighters. I say, wait a minute. Where the this This guy has to be a prospect. He has to be on my list. It was a light heavyweight. He, I said, this guy, and then I saw a lightweight. And then I saw about three or four guys. I said, wait a minute. They have to be on my list he is, they are really, they got a lab going on down there. They are really developing, not not just good fights, you know, not not just good street fights, not just good tough man contests. They, they are developing, fighters are coming out of there. And again, that's not a complicated formula either. When, when you put fighters in, you teach them right, you give them a good base, you give them a good foundation, they got to have good trainers. But then you put them in good competition, guess what? They usually become good if they have talent. And so I, they were on my list. I was like, wow, this, this thing, you know, and, and I'm on there talking to fights and I'm going along with it. But then I say to myself, now I really know that everything we've been talking about, and I've been tra- trusting Paulie Malinacci and Chris Algieri, two of the smartest people in boxing. They are, and I work with them. Uh, former world champions. We, we do the show once a week. I do it with them. And they do the commentating. They do the shows in the boxing life down in Plant City. But I said, they have been shooting it straight. They have been telling me about this. And until I got to see it myself... I, I didn't understand it the way that I did. So that is some b- backdrop on Gary. Also, he is, he is developing, well, it's two things. It's an all-news boxing show. And again, here, color it in for you. But it's an all-news boxing show that I'm part of. And then it's the live fights on Pro Box. And they are taking another step now. They are doing this week... On Friday, on the 28th, 
Pro Box TV is doing their first championship fight. Lamont Roach Jr. defending his junior lightweight title against Fergo McCrory. And <laughs> you know what? No shock. The styles match up to be a really good fight. Lamont Roach is a kid that you have to love. I've interviewed him now twice. Interviewed him. The people here, our fans know. We interviewed him last week. We had we had a huge audience seeing the interview, seeing our show last week. He's he's an articulate kid. He's a he's just a good kid, and he's a good fighter, and he's doing it the old fashioned way. He had one loss. He lost to he lost for the world title in a close fight. He learned from that, and then what does he do? He comes back and wins the world title in his next fight in a in a really good fight, a really tough fight where he drops the champion in the last round to win the fight. So, without further ado, if I missed anything. Gary will fill it in. Uh, I give you Gary Jonas, the founder of Pro Box Television and a pioneer in this sport. Gary, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Teddy. I appreciate that. Gary, take us from where I kind of left off. Um, give the Give the people a little bit of a background of where you came from. And also where your passion, because you do have a passion. You don't do what you're doing unless you have a passion. Turkey al Sheik um, over in Saudi Arabia, who's, who's changing things up, as I said, you know, making big fights. And look, he can make bigger fights. His pockets are a little deeper, a little bit. But you are doing it here on this level. And Turkey al Sheik wouldn't be doing it with all the money that he has Unless he had a passion for boxing, you wouldn't be doing it unless you had a passion for boxing. And with that, I would say a care for the, obviously, the fighters that are in the sport. So please give the fans a little bit of a background of where you're coming from, where that passion comes from, and moving forward with pro box. Yeah, I think the best way to, to back it up and, and, and do it quickly, but put it in perspective, um, I got started about 17 years ago. Shannon Briggs um, wanted to get into business with me on something, Teddy, and Herman Casado. And the first thing I said to him was, look, I want to get in shape. I want to learn the sport. Um, you know, teach me how to box, but teach me how to really box. And I spent six months in the gym with Shannon and Herman every morning, and they taught me how it really works. And I didn't get into spark. I was a little old for that. But from a technical perspective, really understanding the sport, I spent six months in the gym and I caught the bug. And during that period of time, they started bringing me fighters to manage, to promote. The next thing you know, we've got Joan Guzman and we're on TV and I'm a promoter. And, you know, after With a, a guy year, named Iron Mike. Let me, I want to make sure the fans get it. With a guy named Iron Mike. Go ahead. Well, I'm coming to it because a year later, all the doors were closed and I had this bright idea. I'm going to open the doors by going out and getting Mike Tyson to be my partner. And I approach Mike. We make it happen. Um, some of the doors opened, some of them didn't. You know, we went to HBO on Showtime, Teddy. They really didn't care about me. They wanted him to fight again. But uh, ESPN gave us a shot. We did a big show with you guys, um, a special event. You and you and you and Mike kind of had a little makeup reunion, which was nice. And long story short, we had a good run. In, in a year or two, we did a lot of shows on ESPN. Um, we did a lot of shows on Showbox. We were up in the running for the Fox events, and Spike was coming in, and we were in conversation with them. And then all in one week, I get a phone call. And we had Lubin, Sammy Vasquez, Drew here. We had Piano as a champion. Mendez was a champion. And we did all this in about 18 months. And um, we get a call one week. And every one of those TV networks said, sorry, we won't be able to do business next year unless you want to buy the time. I was like, what do you mean? You want me to pay you? You're not paying me? He said, yeah, but you could sell the commercials. What am I going to do? So I called it a day at that point. I called Mike. I said, Mike, we just lost all the TV for these guys. We had 10 guys in the top 10. Um, I said, they're going to need to be on TV, Mike. He said, all right, do what you need to do. And Teddy, I brought them all over to Heyman. I followed the money. I followed the TV because I did what was best for the fighters. And at the time, that was the best thing to do for the fighters. 
So I brought him over to Heyman because he had bought all the TV time with Waddell and Reed. And I sat down. Now, I kind of swore to myself at the time, I was a little upset with the, the TV networks. And I realized at that time, it dawned on me, Teddy, there's a lot of things wrong with the sport of boxing. One of them is the TV networks making boxing sort of filler content. Now, I don't blame them. If if Don King and Bob Marum decided to go to HBO 1972 and take the, their product off of Wild World of Sports and bring the best fighters in the world and put them on pay-per-view and put them in HBO where nobody had HBO 1972, then it's it's fair that the networks were offended. So the network's response to that was, really? Well, then I'm going to concentrate on the NFL and the NBA. And look what they did for the NFL and the NBA since the 1970s, right? And then they put boxing at the back of the bus and said, well, you know, it's, that's, that's the way it goes. So it was a bad decision back then. It hurt it. And really, how do I fix this? So I said, you know, TV's got us at the back of the bus. Boxing can't prosper being the most expensive sport for a fan to watch compared to all the other sports that are free. So I decided when the time came, I was going to become a network. I don't want to be a promoter. I wanted to compete with the networks. And I felt there was a better way of doing this. I knew the game of being a promoter. I knew how to make fights. And I knew that there was a flaw. You, you as a network give your dates to promoters. The promoters want the fighter to win. right? They don't have the other fighter in many cases. So they've got a dog in the hunt, and they want the fighter to win. Well, that's going to impact the matchup, and that's going to impact the product, and then the fan doesn't win. Dana White doesn't have this problem. Dana White, all the fighters perform for him. So now when he watches a fight, all he cares about is the fans. Are they happy or not? But when you don't, when you do it the way boxing does it, managers and promoters are sitting ringside biting their nails, hoping their fighter wins. Even the networks are aligned with the, the, the A side. And that's why you mentioned A side, B side. This is what happens. So I decided, okay, I'm going to break this construct. Little by little, I'm going to chip away at it. I can't do it all overnight. Turkey Alashik is taking it top down. He jumped in with his big bag and said, I'm going to make the biggest and best fights that can't get made because these guys can't afford it or they don't want to do it. Right. And it's good for boxing. I decided to do it bottom up. I built a solid foundation, news, talk show, fight series that is evenly matched action fights. And I'll start from the non-championship level and grow it little by little, but build that solid foundation. It's the, it's the golf channel and it's the tennis channel. It's really covering the sport properly. Boxing had no media coverage, right? And no one was doing it in any sophisticated level. So I really hit on three three pieces of the content. The product is news, talk shows to really promote the sport properly and get people engaged. And then when it comes to fights, give them evenly matched action fights. And with all that said, now we're starting to inch it up. Now we're going to start moving into higher level contenders and opportunistic championship fights like the one we're able to do on Friday night. And... This is really, Teddy, testing the waters. It's really about the team going on the road, the production going on the road. It's running an entire TV network. You, you just don't snap your fingers and try to do, you know, three shows a month. You, you, you inch your way up and make sure that you execute. So that's what we got. And it's a win for the fans. It's great. I'm seeing it firsthand. Um, ultimately, you you gave a you drew a beautiful picture, the right picture. Um, to the fans of where you came from, why you're here, and what's going on right now. Ultimately, where do you see Pro Box in the grand scheme of things in this sport? Obviously, there's a big step Friday night, a uh, world title fight. Uh, you know, where is, are we expecting more of, of world title fights? I mean, are we, where are we going? Yeah, we're going to step it up. We're going to graduate. I think in uh, the next year, you're going to start seeing, um, I'll give the fans a view of the behind the scenes on the business side. Series that we have, which is just the best fighters that didn't make the top platforms fighting each other, that's a $100,000, $150,000 show. If I go to top five, top 10 guys, 
na household names fighting each other. Now I'm stepping into five hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars shows, and that's HBO After Dark. That's that level of series. And then there's that championship fights where you're talking a couple million bucks, if not more. And if it goes past that, it goes to pay per view. So there are four tiers. There's pay per view because it just got too damn expensive. There's two three million dollar fights that are championship headlined by a good championship scrap. There's high level contender battles that are HBO After Dark type stuff, and then there's what we're doing. So we're going to start stepping into the contender level because otherwise, I'm going to make the mistake that the zone made. I'm going to go chase down one superstar, and he'll have nobody to fight. Right? When they went and got Canelo, the other guys in the industry kind of laughed, and they said, "Okay, who's Canelo going to fight?" So he's going to fight a bunch of guys in Britain that nobody knows, that don't belong in the ring with him. And that was their problem. That's why that whole thing busted up. Even Canelo was sort of embarrassed. Like, guys, you got no one for me to fight. I got to leave and go fight on PBC. They got the 168s. So you cannot go from zero to 60 like that. You've got to graduate it up. So this year, contender level, uh, hopefully by the end of next year, we'll start really touching into the championship level. But we're going to have to take it slowly and do it gradually. There's one other side of that, Teddy. It's we've, we do want the sport to be free. And this is a big initiative for me. Why can't boxing be ad supported? All the I'm other. Listening. I'm li you got my attention now. Now, you got all the fans now. When you said that word free, we're all, we're, our ears are perked. Go. Good. Well, so why is baseball, basketball, football, hockey, and, and international football. Why is that free? It's more expensive than boxing. Those guys are making more money. How could it be free? And why do we have to be the most expensive sport? Okay, 50 years ago, advertisers were a little skittish. There was blood in boxing, right? You know, Kellogg's and, and, and Procter and & Gamble didn't want to put their name on boxing because it was violent. I don't think that's the same anymore. I think that we that you can go revisit the idea of free and start bringing in uh, sponsors and, and, and ad dollars. So one of the things that we're doing is we're experimenting with that. Um, we also are worldwide distributed. We're not just in the United States. All those networks you've been associated to before, we're in the U.S. only. We've got a much larger marketplace. So we are going to continue to develop this free model. Now, there may get a point, Teddy where I think that the sponsorships and the audience will monetize the, the contender level fights. And hey, you know what? I might continue going and go, ah, you know what? At a $3 million card, I can't do it. I'm going to lose money. So then I can go back to the fans and say, okay, look, I did the best I could. I'm going to, you guys got to chip in this much per month. But at least I'll keep it down. I mean, right now you got the zone at $20, $25. Their sports content other than boxing is not useful to American fans. So really, the American boxing fan is paying $20, $25 a month for the zone. That's a lot of money for what they're getting in return. I believe Pro Box TV, if it goes to championship boxing, I don't see it being more expensive. It'll be less than $5 a month. And it could work, right? I estimate there's 2 million boxing fans uh, in the United States that are hardcore. There, we bought boxing scene, as you know. So we've got the whole boxing scene database of 1.5 million unique monthly users. We've got our YouTube channel with, with the help of you. We're at over 1.7 unique monthly users coming back multiple times a month. If you do the numbers, there's two to three million hardcore boxing fans. If I give them great value, I give them evenly matched action fights. Let's say three a month of contender level championship fights and I do it for sub $5, they're going to sign up. I can make that work mathematically. So I'm going to see how far it goes. A lot of people have said, how are these guys making money? Well, not. You build a, 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 a skyscraper, right? For two years, you didn't rent it out yet. You didn't sell it yet. You're just building it. Most businesses, you got to build. you got to spend the money first, trust what you're doing, and then you monetize later. So we're building the product, we're building an audience, and then we'll we'll concentrate on monetization when it's ready and it's it's ripe, right? You don't want to rush. So I would say to you, uh, contender level boxing, 
championship boxing is on the horizon. We graduate up to it so that I can bring in the advertisers and the sponsors and do my best to keep those costs down and make it. If it is going to cost them per month, it's going to be nominal. So we'll see free or nominal. And, um, you know, the, the rest of it will just slide along, right? You'll have the talk shows and you'll have the news. You're going to have these probably we're aiming for six of these Wednesday night fights because we're going to go to Europe and we're going to go to Asia. We have to. We can't be global if we're not in prime time over there. So there'll be six of those a month. And then we're aiming for two contender level fights and one championship level fight. That's nine fights a month. Um, I think you'll be surprised. We're going to be able to do it sub $5 per month to the fan and be profitable doing it. Wow. We have not had free television. I often talk about this, that the healthiest time, in the mod never, the healthiest time, I'm not going back to Pabst Blue Ribbon and Friday Night Fights when boxing was, was the biggest sport in the country, quite frankly, bigger than baseball, but I'm going back to the healthiest modern times of boxing, the 80s. And why? Well, two things. You had great fighters. We have great fighters today. People don't even know the great fighters because they won't, well, the secret, they won't fight each other. But we had great fighters. We had Duran, we had Leonard, we had Hearns, we had Whitaker, we, we had Benitez, we, we had all these, Marvin Hagler, we had all the, Matthew Saad Muhammad, we had all these great fighters. But here's what really made it the healthiest time in boxing in the modern era. Two things. One, they were fighting each other which you're taking care of, Alice Sheik is taking care of, and two, that you just stepped in and told the fans you're going to take care of, it was on free TV. It was on network television. That's what made it the most, that is what made it the healthiest period for boxing in the modern era. And it's coming back now because of Alice Sheik making these big fights, but on a consistent level. On a, and what he's doing is great, but on a consistent daily level, week to week, where the people can watch the fights, the fights like they're getting this Friday in the title fight we just talked about with McCrory and Rhodes and, and those kind of fights, you're stepping in to the gulf. You're stepping into the void. And that is a void that had to be stepped into if boxing is going to really thrive, if boxing is going to survive, if boxing is going to get back to where we are. Yeah, the big fights every couple months, that's great, tremendous. But the regular bloodline of boxing, the bloodline of the boxing fan, the connection to the boxing fans is the regular week in and week in, a week in and week out fights. What do you got? That's, that's all the fans want. What do you got for me? And I'll tell you, free and then five bucks, you got a lot of fans who are going to say what I'm saying. You got me. You got me. Um, that is good news. That is great news for the, for the sport, for the fans. I would ask Ken now to, to step in. Please, Ken. Ken has got a degree in finance. I know his ears are pop perking up. Ken has been in the financial world. I know that when he heard Gary talking, I know that uh, I know it made him <laughs> happy. Go ahead, Ken. Well, Gary, first of all, what was your business background before you got involved with uh, Shannon Briggs, Shannon the Cannon? You know, Shannon brought me his product because I was an internet marketer. I had a, a company <clears throat> called Equinity Interactive, and we had about 500 employees in an office building. The Iron Mike Gym was in that building. So um, business background was predominantly uh, recycling and manufacturing when I was a young man. And when that, uh, I then moved to the internet with internet marketing. Um, now I have drug and alcohol treatment centers. We're one of the larger uh, outfits in the country. Uh, we have about 300 beds here in, in Florida, um, and of course, boxing. What did Shannon say that made you consider doing this? Because when we think about the amount of people that have tried to get into this from, uh, what was there, was one during COVID, Box City, Box City or Raw City Boxing. There's just been so many that have come and gone that when I look at this from a business perspective, at times I'm just like, I don't know how people make money doing this. It just seems like, Everyone that tries gets chopped down by the incumbents. 
and and that is the challenge. That there's there's no doubt about it. That's almost why I'm doing it. I I, it, I have to admit I'm I think I'm drawn to the challenge, and that there's so much resistance. I joke that those guys spend more time sitting on a hill, uh, drinking beers and and pushing boulders down the hill at everyone who's trying to get up <laughs> than actually building a mountain out of it. So, um, but no, I, I'm driven by the fact it's broken. It bothers me that it's broken. It's so underachieving, it, it drives me crazy. And because I'm looking at something that is so obviously underachieving, for obvious reasons, it, it can't help but make you want to try to fix it. It's a hell of a challenge, and you know, I'm getting old. I'm, I'm getting to a point, where am I gonna do now? I, I, I think I wanna finish out with an interesting challenge and see if I can fix it. If I can't, uh, I'll be satisfied that I try. Good for you. Well, good luck with everything. Uh, it's very admirable what you're doing, and I'm sure a lot of the fighters really appreciate having you as uh, as an option for them as they uh, climb that hill. Boxing's not famous for, um, well, they are famous for having people climb up the hill and pull the ladder up behind them, as opposed to providing a hand up for others. Well, not for everybody. The ones that run and hold or don't throw a lot of punches don't really like me because I don't allow them to fight on this platform. It's a brand. And it's fan friendly, exciting fights. I mean, I don't mind boxers, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep the action up, and you gotta keep the energy up. There's a 24 second, sh second shot clock in the NBA. The UFC made them get off the mat and stop hugging on the floor. I think everything has to be made a little fan friendly. Boxing's got some bad habits with the running, the holding. And um, and maybe the only counter punching. So we try to make it an action friendly brand. And I'm learning from the MMA on that. I think there's a lot of combat for fans that want to see a fight break out. And boxing lost those fans. So we're going to try to bring them back. I think Teddy can relate to that. Um, but, you know, within reason. But I appreciate you guys giving me the time to share with your audience what we've got over here. And we'll keep going. What I'm going to just before we let you go. And thank you for being here. And thank you for your honesty. I mean, just, just being very candid, very honest, laying it out there, and bringing hope to the fans. I mean, honesty and hope, uh, pretty good combination. I think the fans are going to appreciate this interview, getting to uh, understand who you are, but more importantly, understand what it is you're doing with Pro Box. And the last thing I'm going to say, because you brought it up, yeah, for years, I called the fights on ESPN, most people know, for 20-somewhat years. And for 18 straight, it was Friday Night Fights. And I would always say the most important part of it, it, it wasn't me, it wasn't the, the guys that I had with me doing it. It was, it was the fighters, obviously, but it was the matchmakers. There it is. The matchmakers, so important and you got i gotta tell you i i hope you give them a bonus once in a while you have a really good matchmaker and obviously you're behind it saying hey you better be good because you know what there's there's a lot of unemployment out there and um there's a lot of people that probably would would jump to get this job so you're keeping the the fire lit under his feet there's no doubt about it which is always important but I just cannot stress enough how important in my business, a business that I've been in 50 years, the matchmaking is. And I used to go nuts, and, and they didn't always like it, especially, I'll be honest, especially the promoters. They did not like what I was saying behind that microphone because I would, I would say, wait a minute. Now, you had a month to make this fight. You had two months to make this fight, three months to make this, whatever it was. I know we get fights that fall out. I get it. But I said, and you're going to give me a, one guy that runs and another guy that does nothing but grab? Are you, are you serious? Are you, you couldn't come up with better styles than that? And I can attest to what Gary just said. On Pro Box, matchmaking is at the forefront. Matchmaking is, is, is number one. And that is what the orders are given to their matchmakers. Get me guys that styles make good fights. I just had to say that. Well, thank you, Teddy. Just so you know. I do the matchmaking and I do it for one reason, because 
I don't trust anybody else's diligence in making that final decision about the product for the fans. So my guys do a good job of bringing me options. And every day at four o'clock, three guys are going to walk in my office and they're going to say, okay, boss, here are all the different guys available to us for this guy. And then I go ahead and I research them and I look at their video and I take a look and I decide this is who we're going to use. I'm thinking big and small. I'm thinking the first slot, the second slot, the third slot, the fourth, a, a combination of fights. I'm thinking Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Americans, but I'm not going to discriminate against Russians and anybody else who could fight. I'm thinking blends and combinations. There's a lot that goes into those four slots, whether we start off with prospects and then we graduate. But I want to give the small guys a chance, but put the big guys in. So I do it because that's the final product. That's That's everything. I'm not going to leave that up. On, no, no offense to anybody. I'm not going to leave that up to an employee. I'm going to do it myself. They get friends out there in the industry. They get a little corrupted, right? The one thing that I have to control is the final product that goes out each night. If I'm going to put my time anywhere, I'm going to put my time there. So just, I appreciate the uh, matchmaking compliment. No, oh, well, give yourself a bonus, please. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, thank you for being with us. Thank you for for letting our audience know uh, about what you're doing. It's very important to the future of the sport. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Be well. Take care. Thanks, Gary.